Now, Ragtag, you have a hard out at uh, what? One uh, thirty my time is it, and that would be nine thirty your time. Uh, yes. Okay. That's, about right. that's normally when I start streaming, but more important than that, there's a YouTube upload coming around that time, so I need to uh, monitor that. <laughs> Now, when you monitor your YouTube uploads, what I do is I schedule them in advance like you do, I'm sure. And then I just sort of let them, you don't? <laughs> don't you, you finish them and then you just bank them and schedule them, right? Uh, no. So uh, today I scheduled it because I knew I was doing this. Otherwise, I would be, you know, right in the, on the edge of my seat. Okay. Literally, arsehole clenched and... Uh, just trying to get it out by 9 p.m. my time. But normally I'm really, really late with these things. Can that be my first t-shirt, by the way? Arsehole clenched. <laughs> it's the Edge Boy Streamcast. Arsehole clenched. That's that's a bumper sticker, ladies and gentlemen. If we ever go out again, that's you're going to see that on every fender in the greater Los Angeles area. <laughs> that's how we drive here. Okay. Yeah, see, I schedule mine. I let them go up. And then I watch as the uh, whatever it is comes in and then I move on. You know, I, I, I will answer comments. Do you, you don't answer all your comments. You couldn't possibly. Uh, to be honest with you, most of it is just people saying, oh, look, you're useless. Oh, what a terrible player you are. Uh, so it's like you don't need to answer those. I already know all those things. Right. But um, within the first hour, it's usually really positive. It's usually the notification squad. You know, it's all the people. That- yeah that are real fans of of what i'm putting out so a lot of it doesn't need answered but you know occasionally i'll i'll yeah i'll answer one or two things that seem unique or new or funny or different but after the first hour or so then i i skim every few hours and then the skimming gets more liberal as the days go on (laughs) right i don't know about you but mine i encountered this on reddit and i'm kind of done with reddit now so the first things I did were on Reddit when I just decided, hey, I'm in this game. Maybe I should play it. Hey, I'm awful at this game. I should share that with the world. And, you know, people thought it was funny. And then after a while, every now and then somebody would say, I fucking can't stand this guy. You know, and just it sooner or later, somebody would come out and say, he, he's always posting videos of himself. You know, you just you get that. And I thought, well, it, it was about time. I mean, sooner or later. There's somebody that just musters, musters up enough bile to reach the keyboard and off they go. But on YouTube, it's been, maybe I haven't quite made enough of an impact yet because I've got about a tenth of your subscribers on YouTube. So maybe when I start hitting that level, the, then there'll be more people that crawl out from under their, their rocks. Uh, I don't know. I, don't, I, I would say it depends. My YouTube comments are actually relatively nice compared to a lot of other content creators i don't have the meme lords so much okay i don't know if it's because of my age or because of the way i put my content across i'm not sure but when i go to other people's comment sections i find that it can be extremely toxic and cancerous and all the rest of it but it's almost like it feels like the majority of my comments are in on the joke you know right of of me portraying this uh I'm, i'm not trying to say i'm like the uh, the YouTuber for the people, but I do right. represent the skill set of a large amount of those that are, you know, in Apex. So I think that probably has something to do with why the comments are generally very good. Yeah. But because maybe 40% of my views come from unsubscribed people, those that do sort of coast in that maybe haven't watched that many before come in with some, you know, something not very nice. And I either have to you know, remove the comment or remove the person or, you know, type something back in a very uncharitable but ruthless roast way. Uh, I do that I do that less now, to be honest. It's just too much energy. Well, I'll tell you what Candy Rude told me he did. He uh, sometimes, he gets mostly positive uh, responses too. He does. He does. Yes. Um, he says that every now and then he'll get a, like a toxic comment. And he says, this is kind of sinister of me, but he says, I'll heart that comment. I like I'll love that comment. It sends it up to the top, and as soon as his diehard followers see that somebody is bringing some toxic BS to him, they maul that commenter. And he says, "I just kind of sit back and watch it happen." <laughs> 
So yeah. it's kind of like setting your own personal guard on them, you know. Just... I, I I did used to do that, but that's why I stopped doing it. After a while, I thought it was funny. I pinned the comment. I didn't I didn't just heart it. I put it right at the top where oh. you know it had to be the first comment you see. <laughs> and then I just saw like twenty five replies yeah. of cancer just un unfolding. And the more I, I did it, at first I thought it was just funny, you know. I yeah. just thought it, it was basically a comment such as, you know, you are a washed up old cripple of a youtuber don't upload this this nonsense or something like that right so i thought oh that's a great comment i'm pinning that you know and when i pinned it you know uh, my my diehards went for them and uh it wasn't a very productive thing so it, right. it was fine for a while but it felt like a bad karma thing so i sometimes singularly roast them or just get rid of them now that yeah that's it. but generally it's it's really nice my comment section i call it an appetite of the mind if you only eat the right foods, it will crowd out the bad ones. You won't have room for them. So that's how you get in shape, fitness and nutrition wise. So your diet of the mind has to be the same thing. If you yeah, sure. only fill your mind up with the positive stuff, you crowd out the negative stuff. It's And then you have a cheat day where occasionally you go off on somebody. <laughs> Hey man, it usually happens to me on stream live. That's 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 when people get me at my worst, you know. I think it's it's if people poke you enough, you know, and say dance monkey, please dance. I'm telling you to do something, you know. Eventually when someone else comes in, I'm sure it's the same for you. Eventually someone's going to come in and say do the voice and you're just going to punch your monitor, you know. <laughs> I remember there's only been a couple of times where uh, I've gone off a little bit, but it's mainly at what's happening in the game. My favorite thing is to tell whatever character just downed me in game just to eat a bag of dicks. Mm. So, hey, eat a bag of dicks, Wraith. Eat a bag of dicks, Pathfinder. Because uh, if anyone knows me at all, they know that I fucking hate being killed by Pathfinders. <laughs> I hate it. I, I hate it. I hate it oh. like I love cake is one of the ways I like to say it. And it's because I don't like to hear my own taunts coming back on me. Just I, I, I just think, yeah, I remember recording that and now I got to sit there and take that horse shit. So, yeah. I made a video about why Pathfinder is actually a bad guy. Oh, yeah. Those, yeah. Those, those taunts are the worst. I think he is the most toxic kind of person to die to and because it sounds like he's doing it deliberately just to get you angry you know yeah so i i feel that 100 percent. well that's when i first heard about you because i had no idea i don't know about anybody i, I i'm i people say hey what what tv do you watch right now and it's like I, I don't i don't have a chance to do anything especially now i i look after the kids I, i'm a husband i'm a i'm a um i'm a dad i'm a voice actor and then I do this, and then if there's any time left, which mainly there is not, I binge a few things that you younger kids say, what the, what the hell is that? What is The Crown? I've never heard of The Crown. You know, so yeah, that's the kind of stuff I watch. But somebody says, oh, you got to watch this video. It's Pathfinder is evil. I thought, well, let's give this a watch. And I thought, okay, let me give it a minute to make sure that he really is just kind of taking the piss. And I thought, <laughs> he is and he isn't. You know, and, and I thought, I, I I don't care. That's funny. That's really funny. And I thought, you know what? Maybe Pathfinder is the most evil robot ever. He's never going to tell you. And Apex is never going to tell you. So, and then they brought on Revenant. And you thought, all right, well, actually, that's the most evil robot ever. But, uh, but you know, uh, if Revenant decided to create a robot that would sneak up on you with his evil, maybe it True. would be Pathfinder. <laughs> Although, True. I don't play him that way. I genuinely believe he is the happiest kindest robot in christendom and uh apex at the end of at the end of say 10 years they could say by the way um pathfinder's totally evil he's been poisoning <laughs> everyone on the drop ship every single mission and you never knew it yeah that makes so, sense there's there's one for your for your next video so no i actually don't yeah i've i decided to stop making um that kind of thing uh, mainly because it was uh, consistency. I liked doing, you know, 10 reasons this uh, and five tips for losers. You know, I used to just throw different videos out there just to see what would stick. And then I realized that I liked telling stories of gameplay. So all that kind of stuff at the moment is is done. Everything else is basically I stick a game down. I tell the story, I narrate it a little bit, and then you hear me, you know, um, fail in game. That's pretty much it. <laughs> 
Well, yeah. So gutter tier gaming for you, that is basically, as you have described it, you are the, the what, the best average gamer you've ever seen? How is Very it? Much, Explain that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think when I first started making Apex videos, I wasn't very good at it. I would, you know, my gameplay, I just couldn't gather anything that looked remotely decent. I'd be doing all the wrong things. I'd be aiming down the sights at, you know, point blank range. I'd be taking two shotguns and, you know, I would just, I, I didn't know what I was doing. But I realized that, uh, that this was a kind of a marketable trait. Um, so I started calling myself like top five millionth in terms of rank, you know, and stuff like that. So I basically uh, magnified how I was in game and, and just started uh, making videos, you know, so a bad player giving out tips is, you know, stupid. So I would, I would just say things like, fuck your team, you know, leave them. It was all that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, I just, I just joked. But the problem is over the last year, I've actually gotten a lot better. So now... I uh, pop off now and again and get, you know, 10 kill games and stuff, and that never happened before. So what I have to do is I have to draw as much attention as possible to my mistakes. So when I make a mistake, you know, I basically glorify it, you know, and dramatize it. And uh, yeah, that's that's how the content is. Now, I'm not saying I'm a good player now. I'm, I'm better than I was, but I probably sit a little bit higher than average now. So I'm just not telling people that. Right. Well, here's the good news is if... Um you ever got yourself an Xbox because I'm not getting a PC unless Candy Roo's company makes one for me. Um, I, uh, the, you would be carrying me in a match. I don't know, so, man. I don't know. If, if you're... Uh, well, yeah, that's true. That's a thing I, that, that uh, lulls me to sleep at night is realizing that, yeah, I'm crap, but I'm crap with an Xbox controller. So PC is... I mean, you've got to get used to it, but you could be pretty exact with that cursor, can't you? Yeah. You can. Uh, it. I think they're just two different skill sets. Okay. You know, I, I. I think that the things like the turn speed and the pinpoint accuracy is a double-edged sword. Okay. Because then you need to work out your sensitivity. The lower your sensitivity, then the more you'd need to move your out your mouse arm across the mat, which is what I like to do. I like to absolutely throw my body at my mouse movements. Um, and if you are very very uh, small and controlled and precise you can use higher sensitivity and little flick shots will do a lot but uh, i used to believe that pc was harder than controller gaming because of how accurate you need to be with the mouse but i've come to realize that they are just completely different and rely on different skill sets to achieve the same you know the same goal gotcha um, because the controller has um, a modicum of aim assist so when you aim down the site you know the game will help you um, but you're already dealing with some difficult axle uh, or axes when you're, you know, moving around and whatnot. The PC gives you none of that, so you have to be very precise. Uh, but there's just other challenges. So, you know, I think in, in console gaming, your sensitivity higher is better. In, a, in FPS PC gaming, a lot of us tend to keep it lower. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't think one is harder than the other after quite a lot of debates with myself and others. I think it's just a yeah, completely different way to approach it. Fair enough. What what I've discovered about myself is, I mean, I I don't think it matters if I'm any good at the game or not um, because I have the privilege of being in it. But that has not stopped some people from asking me why I'm so bad at this game because it, some someone actually said, you're in this game. Shouldn't you be good at it? I, that, that's not how voice acting works, uh, my friend. Um, this game is not easy. This is a hard game to learn. Yeah, you get you get the best job as a voice actor because if it was like you know when they filmed the Matrix and they made Keanu Reeves and and uh, and Lawrence Fishburne, they made them do like six or three months of combat training and right. You know, go go and get good at actual fighting, and they were like, oh, yes, it'll take a few weeks, and then it took them months and months. Yeah. they had to actually be combat ready, but. You know, I can't imagine them sitting you down and going, right, okay, 10 hours a day, Apex Legends, let's go. <laughs> no. Let's put it this way. When I recorded this game, I didn't know what the fuck it was. <laughs> and it, this takes place in the Titanfall universe. What's that? It, well, Titanfall is this kind of, that kind of game. Every time they kept describing it, I kept saying, and, and what is that? And oh, and what sort of thing is that? It's like that Monty Python sketch from uh, Meaning of Life, where the uh, owner of the hospital comes in. Uh, today, we're delivering a baby. And what sort of thing is that? 
yeah. <laughs> That's what it was. And so then I start playing the game and I realize, man, this is uh, this is embarrassing. But, you know, if you're lucky enough to be in it, most people just sort of let the rest go. I, I have gotten better, but I could not claim to be top five million. No one would believe me if I said top five million. They'd say, no. No, not you know with that. What? Not with that KD ratio. There's no way that's happening. I think no matter who you are and where you stream or what content you do, you're always going to get people coming on saying you're bad. I've seen some players who are on Overwatch and they're playing for the pro teams, and all their chat comes in first mistake and go, "Why are you so bad? Why didn't you yeah. get tracer? Why didn't you do this, that, and the other?" Everyone seems to be a pro. You know, uh, you put those people under the microscope, you will find yeah some skeletons in their closet. I can tell yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what it must be like if you're Tom Brady. Why'd you lose those three Super Bowls? I don't know, because I was tired from winning the other hundred, you fucking prick. <laughs> Sorry. And I don't even like Tom Brady because I'm an Atlanta Falcons fan and we blew the biggest lead in history to him. But anyway, that's enough of that. Now, since you've been on uh, YouTube, how has being on Apex changed your content because did you get on you you didn't get on with with apex i take it you were on before then correct uh yeah i was making overwatch videos before okay. apex and okay world of warcraft before that so okay yeah, um apex was the the game that was not going to happen and a lot of people asked me to try it while I was on Overwatch. All right. So I did. And I played with two people who would be your worst nightmare for teammates. They're the type that um, they're like predators. They run in. They've killed the entire enemy squads and you don't even know what happened. They, right. they were my teammates. And they were like, oh, pick this up, pick that up. And I, I hated every minute of this because I thought, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I am. I don't know what these attachments are. What is a light extended mag anyway? Yeah. You know, so I, I, I just completely lost sight. And they were all using the guns I hated at the time, which were the wingman. I wouldn't touch that gun at all. Couldn't make anything happen with it. So after three hours, I'd recorded some footage and I went, I'm never playing this game again. I'm not doing it because I, I don't know what's going on. So I made a video saying why I'm not playing Apex Legends. <laughs> Uh, and uh, you know, I'm not touching Apex with a with a barge pole because it's another battle royale, and uh, it, it yeah, the fact that you can respawn people, great, but I'm not interested. So that was the end of it. And then when I played a few more hours um, with no intent of making video footage of it at all, I started to work out what the attachments were, and I started to um, queue without those guys, and my matchmaker experience was better. It was mm -hmm. more kind of, you know, forgiving. And then I realized, actually, this is good. This has got some things that Overwatch has in terms of hero abilities and ultimates. and But it's better because the gunplay is exact. Overwatch is disgusting in terms of the hitboxes and things. I don't like it mm -hmm. where, you know, uh, the hitbox extends beyond the person's player model. And there's this thing with power creep where... A lot of the heroes in Overwatch have become so powerful over time and they've added a lot of abilities that make you lose control of your character. I was tired of the game. So when I started to enjoy Apex, I went, oh, oh, I could make some fun with this. So when I dropped my first video down um, about, you know, toxic tips for losers, it was just a bit of fun. And it actually took off. When it took off, um, the original video, why I'm not playing Apex, started to gain views. <laughs> And I was like, oh, no, no, that video bombed, you know. And uh, yeah, so then people were like, oh, man, you looked like you were having fun with Apex. And I was like, oh, geez. So I had to take it down um, <laughs> to make sure that, you know, people didn't get the wrong idea because I thought I am going to make Apex footage after all. I am going to make videos on this. But YouTube started recommending the very one video where I said I wasn't going to play it anymore. So I was getting called a hypocrite and a liar. And I was like, oh. Oh, dude, I just changed my mind, right? Well, then that's so, the that's the next video. Why I will now start playing Apex. <laughs> and no, the video just... after that was um, why you all suck at Apex, Legend, yeah. Apex Legends or something. It was. <laughs> well, so yeah. Now, you you definitely seem to be somebody who is absolutely into the gameplay aspect of it. How much of the story uh, has kept you coming back? Is it more incidental? Or is it, does it deepen the game experience for you at all to know backstories of the characters, to see how they've carved out personalities? Don't worry. I can take the criticism. It's okay. doesn't matter that you're talking to one of them. Just, you know, 
<laughs> just so i'm a big believer of making sure the core game works the core right. game is good uh, has a lot of variety to it and i'm not a big fan of adding characters to a game willy-nilly because that's what happened to overwatch and that's what killed that game for many people myself included however however every time uh, overwatch came out with a big cinematic and something that deepened the character experience that all of us resonated with and it's the same with apex um, when things popped, like the Revenant uh, stuff that came out with that, amazing. Mm -hmm. These are very important. And, you know, if Respawn chose to expand on the existing legends more and stop adding new ones, I would be so down with that. I would like to know more about who's there already rather than now we've explained one cinematic for, you know, Bangalore, let's say. Now let's go and add another legend. For me, I don't think this is how to add longevity to a game. For me, I like the existing cast that we are basically, we know them, we love them, we play them all the time. You would want to see, from my point of view, more about what's happened to them, more about their history, because a four minute, five minute cinematic, it's great. I mm -hmm. would love that, but uh, we could do with more of that rather than saying, here's the next legend, here's the next legend, because what that ends up doing is creating meta problems um, in terms of who to take, where to take them. And for me, if the core gameplay is good and the lore within what you've already got is rich and, and deep, then I think it's, yeah, it's a lot better. So I would be um, happy to see to see more stuff about the, the background of Apex, the background of the Leviathans mm -hmm. um, put in, if they're merging more things in the Titanfall and you, using some of the history and putting it into Apex Legends, great. Love all that. I just don't like to see every season in comes a new legend. I don't want to see 20 heroes um, to play to pick from in this game. For me, I don't think that would be the, the way forward. But I could be wrong. It's just uh, I think it takes a lot of resources to make another legend and to put all their abilities in the game and to make them work in the game. I'd rather see map variants. I'd rather see, you know, perks or um, swapping out abilities with another hero that exists already. Uh, that I just think, yeah, you've got a really good thing. Don't ruin it, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, you're not wrong because it's your opinion. Opinions aren't wrong. They're simply your subjective experience with the game. And so for you, sure. deeper, not wider. You would like to go into the backstory I, more. You know, yeah, that kind I, of thing. I don't mind the, like, say a new legend comes in. It should be uh, a rare experience for me. It should uh -huh. be something that you expect. So what Overwatch did was they, they kept adding, you know, heroes every so often. And you would be able to predict when that would be. And for, for, for all of us, all it ended up doing was making the game harder to play and harder to work out how to do things. Gotcha. But Apex is a little easier in the fact that it is a core shooter. Everyone's guns shoot the same. It's just that abilities can start to matter. And the more abilities you add into a game and the more ultimates you add into a game, you're going to create problems and you're going to create combos, unwanted combos, things that mm -hmm. were you know not intended but then break the game. And there right. are things in Apex that have broken multiple times accidentally without even talking about hero balance. Things like, you know, smashing people inside the dropship. I don't know if you remember that bug, but you could do that. You could actually punch people in the dropship before you even landed at one. <laughs> no, I didn't know that. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. You could punch the supply bins and launch yourself across the map. Like there, there have been lots of bugs in Apex and uh, lots of unintentional things happen whenever you change the game. So I just think that you know, if, if I was talking about lore itself and, and stories and character, I would like to know more rather than, so what they've given with Pathfinder, you get the occasional poster, you'll get mm -hmm. something saying, this is Pathfinder doing one of his odd jobs, window cleaning, you know, this is blah, blah, blah. Or you'll see a data log saying this, that, and the other uh, from Pathfinder search for his creator. Again, I like these, but we could get more than that. You know, we could have something else come in so if they were going to you know like give a an alternate ultimate or they were going to give them a second set of abilities that you could maybe select there could be something in there that ties in with that um i don't know if they're ever ever going to go that way but you know i i do think i would like to see more of what we've already got as someone who is bound by an nda i am not allowed to tell you if you're going to see any more of that so i will simply let that pregnant pause breathe for a moment how did you get into creating content and just gaming in general because uh, you're a young lad of 40. So, you know, see me, old guy, I, I can this explain. Yeah, I know, this is coming, yeah. 
You, you young whippersnappers out there, I understand why you get into the gaming with your, with your, 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 I don't know, your Overwatches and the Titans fallen and uh, whatever, da, 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 whatever. See, I'm in the game, so I play it, because otherwise I wasn't playing games. I was playing with my kid, whatever games he liked. So I got in and I thought, oh, this would be fun content to make, connect with the community. And yes, also a nice side venture for me, something I'm enjoying doing. How did you find your way into gaming and to content creation? Okay, so gaming, uh, I've basically got the same story as a lot of gamers, except mine is, uh, I'm, I'm one of the older whippersnappers. The moment they brought out the Atari, the 2600, I think it was called, I can't remember its name. I had uh, it. That was like... 1979 i think it came out but you know i was obviously just born that year you were just um, a twinkle in your daddy's eye that's it after that i had pretty much every computer or console at some point so i would have the amstrad cpc 464 the commodore 8 the commodore 16 the spectrum the spectrum zx the yep. what a plus three whatever it was the amigas the master systems the mega drives all the weird consoles as well we would usually get them at some point okay um, i wasn't well off as a kid you know we got these things later than they came out a lot of them except for the atari i think but uh yeah it, i would say i've always had a computer or a console uh, usually a, it was a console and uh when i was working in the music industry i would uh tear clothes out of my suitcase to make sure that I could fit my console in with me when I traveled. <laughs> ah, wow, that's so, that's yeah. commitment. Well, it, it was more kind of like, um, I I come across as an extrovert to people in terms of my character and all the rest of it, but I am a pure hermit introvert. I like my own time. Uh, I don't mind performing or being on stage or anything like that, but once I'm done, it's me, mine, my own and the gaming is a big part of that. It's a big part of my own shutdown time. So there are, there are two types of, of people in terms of energy I see. There are people who gain energy by being around others, mm -hmm. and there are people who gain energy by being by themselves. Uh -huh. That's me. Uh, so uh, that's how I get my energy. I get it by being alone. And when I'm with others, I find by the time I'm done, I'm drained. I've had enough, I'm tired. Um, but other people, when they've been around others, they feel like they've they've gained energy and they feel happier. And you know, I'm like, geez, that's enough of that. <laughs> so, yep, yep, talking. You know. <laughs> so apparently, there are people who uh, gain energy by sucking it out of you, and uh, <laughs> they're the the social vampires, as it were. <clears throat> as you just your face just gets paler and paler as they keep talking, and you think. I'm going to go have a lie down now because uh, your story has exhausted me, sir. <clears throat> yeah. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm quite, I don't want to use this word, but I'm quite sensitive uh, when it comes to human interaction. I'm quite, right. uh, how can I put it? I, I used to avoid eye contact with a lot of people because I thought that it was my dad. Like my dad was a real, I don't want to use the word tyrant, but. That's the right word. Because of the way he'd look at me when I was in trouble, I, I would yeah. often dart my eyes down. But I realized in social situations, I actually read a lot into what people do micro-wise expression. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not good at reading people, I don't, I, but I pick up on a lot of stuff. And uh, it's a lot of information. And when I'm talking to them, I feel like I spend a lot of energy with them. So by the time I've done that, I think, oh, wow, that's, okay. know, that was a the lot. But that makes perfect sense to me because, uh, look, you you and I belong in the same tribe here. Um, I was a stand-up comic for 10 years on the road professionally. And I gain energy by being in a room full of people, but after a while, I have to leave. My wife even tells me this. She said, we'll have people over. <laughs> Not lately, but uh, we'll have people over and you'll just vanish after a while. And I say, yeah, I have to, I have to recalibrate. I have to get away. I have yeah. to shut the door of the little studio here, and then I'll come back out and I'll check in. But uh, for the most part, she says, yeah, even your friends, even your comedy buddies who come over, sometimes you'll vanish and then you'll come back out. It's like, yeah, I have to be alone with my thoughts for a little bit. I, I have to go inside. I have to go inward. And then I'm fine. But um, I've found this with a lot of artistic people not just artists and writers and singers, but also people who perform, who appear quite gregarious on stage. 
uh, Jerry Seinfeld in one of his Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. That's one of the best series on TV. If you okay. want to get inside the mind of a comic and if you want to get inside the mind of an artist, go and look at his episodes. You will absolutely binge them because they're going to start revealing quirks and you'll see yourself in them. And these are genius creators, genius performers. And he gets in their heads and he reveals his own quirks. And he says, I've never been good at reading facial cues. I can't do it. He says, I'm practically autistic in that way. He says, I cannot pick up on people's expressions. I have to go with their tone of voice. I have to go with their body language, but I can't read faces. And that's, that's him for whatever reason. And he has made a brilliant career out of reading audiences, but one-to-one, he says, not, I don't do it well. So you'd be surprised. And um, a lot of us performers, a lot of us outgoing people are also extremely sensitive to the mood of another person, to the vibe in a room, we'll pick up on it. Oh, man. It hits me in the face from like six feet away when someone's uh, yeah got something on, yeah, like uh, weighing them down or all the rest of it. Yeah, it's, it goes whoosh right across. So I find that to me is sensory, uh, a lot of sensory information. Yeah. Um, and whilst it can it can be positive, it's just it does often just the same as yourself. I just need that time. Yeah. So yeah, yeah it'll yeah, weigh yeah. down on you. However, if I'm having a conversation with someone, if I'm having a back and forth, I can sit there forever. If we're having a back and forth where we're trading ideas and it's very Socratic, I am absolutely fine. But if I'm just sitting around and flack is going up all around me, eventually I'll just go, I'll be back. <laughs> I just, I'll take off. I'll, I'll get on the web and surf and I'll do something. And it's just like a little health bar slowly going back up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then, oh, it's green. Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> How's it going? So I feel you. Your trade, your career before this was fireman, first responder, the kind of person that, you know, actually you didn't want to see because, oh, some shit went down. (laughs) So that was your life for quite a while, correct? That's right. Yeah. For a few years, at least. Okay. Um, And I mean, is, is it something you're comfortable talking about, you know, where you are with it now? Or, you know, we can always just move on to the next topic. Yeah, I, I, I'm happy to talk about it. Do you want me to give you a, a little sort of a pathway to... Uh, well, take me, if you will, take me from, you know, uh, from soup to nuts, from the womb, if you like. Ragtag, little ragtag scurrying about with his Atari 2600. How do you go from that kid, every, any facet of your life that you think is relevant, how do you go from being that kid to this person now playing, making content, and what were the twists and turns along the way? Because everyone has them. Okay. But yeah, it's, I'm, I'm going to have to give you a really short version because it's, uh, it's a long, long story. Um, but my I have life, time. That's, I know, but even <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I hear you. 40 minutes would not tell this story. Um, Got it. But uh, yeah. As basically as far back as I can remember, one of my first um, memories is of my father and his music. Music was everything to him. So firefighting is kind of like a, um, and if at any point during my musical endeavors, I heard that I was going to be a firefighter, I would have laughed it off because I don't, oh, I did not have the uh, the systemizer's hands, the systemizer's way of, of thinking like the, uh, you know, the grafter who can go into the shed and pull out tools and do man things. You know, that was just never me. I was never like that. I didn't care about any of that. But my dad was that guy. Okay. He was the the, the guy that could... uh, My my dad was uh, called a polymath, which I have now been called as well. Uh, A polymath, for those that don't know, because I had to have this explained to me, is is a person of great learned interest. Uh Uh-huh. That is someone that can turn their hand to many things. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my dad was a, a pilot, um, a mechanic, uh, a preacher, um, a music teacher, uh, opera singer. You know, he did all these things. Uh-huh. Anything he decided he wanted to do, he did. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't, it was just, it, that was it. Once he decided, it happened. So this should give you some future insight to how the firefighting came about. Because as soon as I put my mind to that, it happened. Right. Um, so I, I have that from my dad, mm-hmm. uh, that kind of 
you know, once I say it's happening, it doesn't matter what the obstacle is, boom, it's going. Um, but my earliest memory was was him and his piano playing and his singing mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Um, and I was fascinated by it. So he put me on his knee when I was a little nipper and he would um, show me the keys of the piano and I was really interested. And uh, I just got kind of, you know, uh, taught a few things, but then he was too busy. So he gave me piano books and said, sit there, do this, you know. Mm -hmm. So it would always be these one, two, three ABC books. And eventually I got bored and did my own thing and just started to self-teach myself. So all my piano skills now are, I've got horrible habits because I just, you know, self-taught. Right. Um, but then I took formal violin lessons um, when I was seven and played the violin for 10 years, hated it hated it i honestly just i don't know what it was about it. it was just you know it was just a big uh screechy scrawly thing when i was um young one of my fingers got cut off and reattached and it never fully healed so I, it works but when i make a fist i can't like this final joint right here doesn't quite go all the way without some push so um as you play the violin, you need this finger. It's your fourth finger. Uh -huh. And my teacher would say, oh, it's okay. Just swap positions. Just, you know, when you get to the, the third finger, you move to the first one again. And, you know, like you have to, I had to do that more often. Mm -hmm. And it was basically work around it or make a horrible noise. So right. there's vibrato on the violin. So every time you hit a note, you can like move your hand. Oh, that's a dangerous, <laughs> dangerous gesticulation to me. <laughs> but... Uh, so you make your vibrato, <laughs> but on the fourth finger, I just, I couldn't get it to work. So by the time it came to my, um, my 10th year of the violin, uh -huh. I was doing my, uh, my music exams and the violin was my instrument. And when I did my mock exam, which is like the kind of the pathway for your final grade, mm -hmm. They told me I failed and they said that the violin was just no good, you know, and that's because I didn't practice. I didn't I didn't give a shit. Right. So uh, I was very good at music. I was very good at musical things. I was interested in composition, making film scores and video game soundtracks, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I didn't really care about the violin, but I knew I needed it to pass my music exam. So they told me that I, you know, I needed to take up uh, another instrument within the next month or so before the final exam or i was going to have to improve and it wasn't going to happen so i uh had no answer i thought well this is the end of this chapter of my life because i've really screwed things up now and then my music teacher at the time said uh do you sing and i went no but then, <laughs> isn't your dad a singer uh, yeah but i i i don't you know then they put me in a, in a room gave me a singing lesson and went whoa you can sing. Ah. <laughs> okay. So I basically ditched the violin from there, did singing, realized I was good at it. And um, then I took formal classical training on it. That then became my pathway to university for my degree for which I trained um, a bachelor's in music with honors that led on to a master's in music with uh, opera as a, speciali a specialization then onto a master's in opera. Um, so I basically went right into singing, like balls deep, full, full, you know, full steam ahead. And that became, you know, everything to me. Um, so I went and did international opera. I did it all over Europe. Uh, wow. I really enjoyed it. It's, um, it was the place where a lot of opera singers want to be, but uh, it's a very competitive market and probably similar to voice acting, but more niche in the way that uh, an opera singer, you, you basically train the same amount of time as a doctor would, maybe longer, uh, maybe, okay. maybe longer. And when you come out at the end of it, there's no guaranteed job. A lot of opera singers end up in choruses mm -hmm. in these opera houses and various places with a really bad wage or they end up teaching and doing little bits of gigs here and there. It's, it's a really hard life. Uh -huh. But if you're good, if you're really, really good, you become a, a principal artist, which is someone who goes around on stage taking, you know, uh, whatever opera it is, and you go and take a six-week contract, you rehearse the opera there for four weeks, and then you do a two-week run of shows, or you can do longer contracts. It, it really depends mm -hmm. what it is. But these people need agents and i had an agent 
and they basically, you know, <coughs> some of them are snakes and vipers and uh, do all sorts of sinister things to get your money. Um, do you have any of them? Do you have an agent? Or I have uh, six agents. Um, technically, God. yeah. Well, technically, I am represented by an agency, Cunningham, Escott, Slevin, Doherty, or a CESD talent agency. They are all lovely. They are all wonderful. And in voice acting, for me, because I have a, um, I have a broad range of things that I can do, and so there are two agents for animation and video games, two agents for commercials, and two agents for um, trailers and promos, which I do very little of, but mainly the promos and trailers I would do, I would voice match somebody because I'm a mimic. So uh, that's one thing I could do. And so uh, there are six agents that are responsible for sending me and hundreds of clients auditions. And they, um, they don't do the things that, say, a manager or talent agent might do for someone like an opera singer where they, um, they may have more access or entree to elements of your career where they could do something behind your back. I mean, a, a bad agent can certainly sink you, that's for sure. And a good agent can blow you up big time like mine have. And my, principally, Pat, uh, Pat Brady is the reason I have a career. She took me from the road to being with her agency and then to a larger one. And so for every bad thing that might have happened to you or your colleagues, there is a mirror of that. Long story short, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting. But the 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 agents in, in opera would would do snakish things to benefit themselves and the artists. So they would do things like, if you're doing a a, a theater run of ten shows, uh-huh. on the ninth show, um, that day you're due to be in another country to start another contract or there's another co- contract available in that country at that time but if you don't start then then you don't get the money the agent would say things like just tell them you've got the shits you know <laughs> <laughs> tell them you've got the squirts you know yeah <laughs> um and uh well, and then you know just tell tell your standby that you're not going to be going on that night you know so they would say things like that to try and get you to take as much money as possible because it puts money in their pockets um, or they would they would just do things, you know, that um, make excuses to other opera houses, and sometimes they would say, "Don't worry about the last two shows; you don't have to do them," you know. But then not tell you how they're going to get you out of it, you know. It's it can be very very bad. But anyway, uh, I had a couple of agents, and and uh, one one or two of them were good, and one or two of them were really bad like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Um, but the life of touring is not for everyone. And I say that because if you're a single guy, single girl, you are okay with going around, meeting lots of people, um, visiting lots of countries, but you don't have a steady place to live, or you do, but you don't go there often. Uh, you, ha- you have to be used to living out of a suitcase. So if you've mm-hmm. got someone at home and you know, you, you're looking to see them, uh, it's not good. So my <clears throat> second wife... Uh, <laughs> And I are were were both opera singers, and okay. we saw each other once in a period of nine months. At one point, wow! I would come back, she would go away. She'd come back, I'd go away, and it was like, this is no way to live. And um, she got pregnant, and as soon as she got pregnant, we were like, uh, this doesn't work, does it? <laughs> this really does not work. <laughs> so. Uh, I decided that was enough of that, and I wanted to quit. And I had some other problems. Uh, I had some, you know, anxiety and and depression and stuff coming in. Um, I was just having a few kind of issues with, I don't know. I think that sort of thing where you're like, what am I doing? What am I doing in my life, you know? I had one of them. How old, uh, if I may ask? Yeah, if I may ask, how old were you when when that kicked in? 28. Okay. Um, I was yeah. on the road for about, well, you're, a lot of times you're just pre-wired for that kind of thing. And artists, I think, are in most cases pre-wired for that. And uh, you, you go back and look at your life and you see little bits of anxiety that would work their way through. And you go, oh, this felt like it came out of nowhere, but it doesn't really. It always comes from somewhere. For me, at about 30, yeah. I had already put in seven years on the road. Like you said, single guy. 
lived out of a suitcase. I didn't tour as much as some others. I was doing about 30 weeks a year. And I remember once I was in a hotel. The comedy club was in the hotel, which happened a lot. I took the elevator down from my room. I start walking towards the gig. I was going to be the headliner. It was going to be a fun one-nighter. I was going to make some decent money. And I started to feel a little anxious walking down the hallway. And I thought, where's that coming from? Where's that? What, what's that about? And slowly, over a period of three or four years, it just, every now and then, it would come. And then, before I knew it, I was talking to a cognitive behavioral therapist at 34. Because it had reached a point where I was having just a general anxiety, panic attacks. And you think, this is coming out of nowhere. It must be something else. It's like, it's not coming out of nowhere. You're unmoored. In general, whatever it is that anchors you to being balanced, to having the kind of routine and life and goals that you like to have and need to have to feel good about yourself and about your life is not there. And you don't have the skill set to put it in. This person's going to teach you that. And so I totally connect with the way this happened for you. And yes, it was in the midst of a relationship that also was starting to go down. And so as you start losing something that normally you would use for balance, it's just, uh, I'm adrift. And here's how it comes out. For sure. It's, yeah, the, the body just eventually just tells yeah. you, you know, yeah. I'm done. I'm yeah. done, you know, and it's basically saying no, because I wouldn't, you know, so yeah. I hadn't, I hadn't dealt with some stuff and uh -huh. it's the same as you i needed therapy after that and yeah fact, i i firstly went and had hypnosis which was yeah. only uh, which was good but it wasn't the problem hypnosis was basically so i could get myself back on stage okay that, that didn't solve it. it it was therapy that was needed because i'd been sucking some stuff in this right. is stuff i don't think i'll be able to talk about but um, that's fine it, it's it's more that it I, it's not that I wouldn't actually. It's just you know I think this is going to get in the way of the story. To get to how I got to content creating. That's fine. Um, we can always revisit this another time. We could absolutely. We could. I um, think honestly, I think people need to hear it. Gamers need to hear it. Gamers spend a lot of time indoors, especially now. Yeah. They don't always know that sure. in them bubbling up is something they're going to have to deal with later if they don't deal with it now. Mm -hmm. And here's two guys that have. So just you know. And yeah, still are. And, and it was bad. Like things yeah. got real bad. I was on meds at first, but don't get me wrong. I think medication is good for the symptoms, but it didn't, again, address the problem. If you don't yeah. go to the problem, then the meds, uh, you know, they're just basically treating something, but the underlying is always going to be there. So if you want to get off the meds, you've got to do the, the work. Yeah. Um, and uh, I have That's, a great yeah. respect for, for the pharmaceutical industry's um you know, ability to to stave off some of the problems that prevent us from functioning as human beings. But with things like anxiety and depression, they need looked at as well as yeah. the the meds. But the meds allow you to get above that horrible point where you're yeah. just hitting rock bottom all day long. Um, but I came off them the more uh -huh. I knew what was going on underneath. And, well, uh, yeah, yeah, it's funny. The the uh, the cognitive therapist I worked with said, "Look, do you feel like harming yourself?" or other people. And I said, no, sometimes I despair, I know, but I don't feel like doing that. And he goes, okay, we're not going to do meds then. Because yes, if you're about to harm someone or yourself, get on something because that's going to even you out. And then you're going to be in the mindset to receive therapy. And as you start to balance out and learn some new habits, then they get you off them. I never reached that point. I took exactly one antidepressant and I thought, well, that makes me kind of nauseous. I don't like that. And he goes, you, you don't need them. All right. You particularly are not going to need him. He may not say that to somebody else, but he said in your case, no, we're not going to do that. So, yeah, for people out there who are on them, perhaps that's where you are in this stage. We're not saying, oh, throw them away. Talk to your professional and they yeah. will decide the time you, you to get off. Them, but, yeah. but there's more to do is, is all I'm saying. Yes. But for me, I needed them because uh, I was the guy who uh, I went in to pay for my petrol with, uh, at the station. Oh, my gas, sorry. Uh, I call it petrol. No, petrol. Uh, I know what it and, is. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's just for anyone else that looks at it and goes, what's that, you know? Yeah. Uh, so go to the gas station and uh, I'd be about to hand the money over and then I'd burst into tears, feel my stomach ringing, and then I'd be on my knees. I was just crying and crying okay. and crying. So I was one of those. Then I realized I didn't want to go outside anymore and I was bursting into tears 50 times a day. It was horrible. Yeah. And uh, I didn't know that these were panic attacks. I just yeah. I just couldn't stop the crying. Right. And uh, when I went to my doctor, I said, I'm, I'm uncontrollably crying right now. And uh -huh. when I do, my stomach feels like someone has just gone like this. And yeah. she said, yeah, you're having panic attacks. 
I went, right, that explains why I think I'm about to die every time that happens, you know? Yeah. So I just, yeah, this was new to me. So, you know, but that dark period, um, yeah, got through that. Uh -huh. And uh, I had no more opera for the time being. Uh -huh. I decided to start teaching. Uh, mm -hmm. I did some lecturing. I did some charity work, um, like to help little organizations um, locally up here, up in the mm -hmm. north of Scotland. And after a few years of that, I decided I wanted to know if I could sing again. Uh -huh. And it was more like a, a proof to myself kind mm -hmm. of thing. You know, I, I, I don't know. I don't really know if I ever planned to go back full time. I didn't let that question arise. I mm -hmm. just needed to know that I could get back on stage again. So I did a lot of work, got myself an agent again, went back on stage, did a 12 week tour and went, I've still got it. I'm really pleased with that. But I realized this is the same problem as before. And I had three children and uh, <laughs> so I, uh, yeah, I stopped it there and then. And then right after that, um, about a year off of the touring, my neighbor um, just uh, appeared at my doorstep and said, uh, we've got some uh, problems. And I was like, oh, what, what's that? And he said, yeah, we're short firefighters. Do you want to be one? Uh, ah. No, I'm all right. I'm, uh, I'm teaching. <laughs> um, I'm doing lecturing at the university and I'm doing little bits here. And, right. You know, um, so I, I just said, I'm not interested, you know. And, and he said, what, why not? And, and I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm not that guy. You, you're that guy. You, you look at a problem and you fix it. I'm the guy that if it's music related or it's drama related, if it's something to do with the voice, uh -huh. if it's to do with articulatory phonetics and accents, maybe I can do something with it. But you're talking about firefighting, man. I, I don't, I don't know how to do any of this. And then I, uh, I thought, right, okay, I'll, I'll have a think about it. So mm -hmm. the, the idea just simmered, and I decided that I would see if I could get fit. So I, I decided to go for a few runs. And within a month, I'd done my right knee and my right knee was wrecked. So he asked me again within a month and said, you know, do you want to tell me if you've given it any more thought with the old firefighting? And I was like, no, mate, my knee is wrecked. I'm, I'm at an osteopath right now. Again, it looked at, you know, and my osteopath was working on my knee and eventually told me that my hamstrings were just over tightened. Yeah. So um, he, he felt them and said they were like the size of onions <laughs> and, uh, and then I was like, oh, God, there goes my excuse. <laughs> I think I, I might be able to get fit. So the more I tried to get fit, the more I realized that I wanted to explore what it is a firefighter is. So the, uh, the, my neighbor just said, come down to the station, have a little look at what it is we do, and then, you know, see if you like it. So I went down when they did their training. And when I first got there, the first thing they were looking at was... Um, respiratory um, problems with road traffic collisions and it was like a really serious subject and I thought whoa whoa I've just been doing respiratory anatomy with uh, university students to do with the voice uh -huh. so because I was now teaching I was teaching about the anatomy of how the voice works in terms of how the vocal cords come together to vibrate to create air pressure because it's all to do with resonance and they figured you're an opera singer you know how it works teach it to them which is true yeah, um, but whilst uh, you know that that was like a, a semi-related subject, I knew what they were talking about. And the other firefighters were all scratching their heads when the body parts were getting you know labelled out to them. And uh, you know, the, at one point, I was able to pipe up and speak to them about clavicular breathing. And and then <laughs> at that point, I thought, you know, maybe I could do this. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is something in here. You know, I, I hadn't thought about firefighters and road traffic collisions, but. Unfortunately, after I became one, I didn't realize how much you do that is not fire related. Right. Honestly, the, the amount of things that a firefighter does that is not actually fire is huge. Yeah. So, they, yeah, they deal with a lot of things. Um, so once I attended that training session, I ended up attending every training session until uh, I started going through my own training to become one. And that was difficult. To become a firefighter, they don't make it easy because what they do is they, they keep raising the standards uh, every year mm -hmm. and they make it harder physically, they make it harder mentally. There's these tests, there's personality tests, there's, I think they're called psychometrics, where they, they assess your ability to think on the spot, they assess uh -huh. your mathematical ability. And the, the mathematics questions were ridiculous because they would give you 15 seconds and this would be the question they would ask. Uh, you'd get a calculator, but uh, the question would be something like 632 divided by 9 plus 15 times 6. Um, and then it would be something like, you know, uh, 
minus 100 times 2,000. And then it, that, it would put some things in brackets. And by the time it got to the 10 second marker, I was still typing it into the calculator, you know? So, and then uh, what, what they were looking for, because I passed, uh-huh. I'm shite at maths. Uh-huh. Uh, anyone who watches any of my content knows me and maths do not go. Right. What they're looking for is someone who can just get the job done. Someone that can solve a problem or get the nearest thing. So I stopped typing things in on the calculator. I started just looking at it going, this looks like it's about the number 40,000. It looks like it's about the number this. They wanted uh-huh. someone that could get it done. Nobody could type in in 15 seconds these long equations and then answer them. Right. What they wanted was someone who would take a, a strong guess and get it sorted. Gotcha. I'm still not 100% sure if that is how it worked, or I just lucked out five times in a row when it came to those math questions that were too hard. Some of them were really easy. Some of them were like, you know, there's X liters in this and five liters in that. How much do you need for this fire? You know, it was that simple. Right. But when it was like long, long, long ones, you know, I I just got to the first one and, oh, I'm going to have to just think about this and not type it in because it's too much. It could be that they just wanted to see how you handled an impossible problem. Exactly, exactly. That's what I concluded. And then it was the same with all the other things. They give you impossible scenarios. Right. But then they do things like um, you get uh, pre-sort of aptitude tests where they check if you're okay being in in enclosed spaces, like they test your claustrophobia. They test your sense of heights. And I'd never been up a big ladder before, so they put me up like 30 meters in the air and then showed, showed us this technique on the ground called a leg lock. Um, which is how you put your your feet and legs through the rounds of a ladder uh-huh. um, and lock it in, and then go Titanic, put both hands out, <laughs> lean back, oh, and then you have to look back at the instructor who's holding up a small piece of paper with a sign on it and with a shape on it. You have to tell them what the shape is. So you look down and go, "It's a fucking triangle." You know. <laughs> so, Why is he crying the... again? I thought he got yeah, over yeah. the crying. But everyone was swearing by the time they were looking back. It's, of it's course. It's a goddamn square, you know? I, I, right about then, you must have been thinking, I wouldn't mind being on an opera tour right about now. I, oh, I... God. So <laughs> then the, they, they also do things like put you in a dark um, container and give you a cage to crawl through. They put loads of gear on you, like 10, 15 kilograms worth of gear, and say, crawl through this cage. By the mm-hmm. way, we're shutting the door. You shut the door. It's completely uh, total darkness. And then they make you crawl through these cages and find your way out. And it's terrifying because they put these masks on you without um, this breathing apparatus (laughs) masks, but without oxygen running through the canister. So it's really, really uncomfortable. As you're breathing through these masks, you don't really feel like air is going in. You just feel like you're breathing in droplets of your own sweat. You know, you feel feel like all you're breathing in is just hot, stinky, muffled air, air, you know. And then at the same time, that there's so little space in this cage where you can do literally this to get through. It's right. almost like, did, uh, do you ever watch uh, Bruce Willis's Die Hard 1 when he's in the vent shaft? Yeah. Um, and and he's, he's like going, oh, we'll have a few laughs with the lighter. Come it's out like to the ghost. We'll have some yeah, laughs. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. Yeah. But imagine you've got like loads of fire gear on as well and a big ass mask and you have to crawl through um, ups and downs and like just a snaky tunnel. So they do these kind of things to me. And a lot of people just aren't cut out for that. No. But when it happened to me, all I kept saying to myself was, they're not going to let me die in here. There's no yeah. way. They're not going to be able to afford the insurance from this shit. You know, right. so that's what I, that was my my logic at the time was basically they're not going to let me die in here. Um, but uh, the ladder one was a bit more scary uh, because even though I had a harness on, that was that was a test that I never knew how I felt about heights before that moment. Everyone yeah. thinks, oh, I'm okay with heights or no, I don't know about that. Right. Until you get shoved up a ladder and told to Titanic it and then, you know, look down. Uh, yeah, so they want you to look down and see how you feel. Yeah. They're testing you every moment. I um, have learned, well, I have learned about myself. I can handle a lot of really scary stuff, but it's not in a calm manner. I have found that I have an extremely responsive nervous system. And I can go into a doctor's office, be the picture of health, but if he takes my blood pressure, I have what they call uh, white coat hypertension. Not always, but it's something where they say, oh, your blood pressure is... Uh, but with this lab work, you're very, very healthy. And I said, just measure it again in 10 minutes, in five minutes. And it's, oh, it's right back down. So, yeah, it's just 
I have a I have a nervous system that just goes I'm bing. Same. I'm exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. It's like, wait, why is your blood pressure like that of an old lady who eats nothing but uh, fried food? It's like, because it'll be fine in, in 30 seconds or whatever. Yeah, don't measure my heart rate. It will go through the roof. You know, like, don't yeah. do that. You know? Don't measure anything that you're supposed to measure because I'm going to freak out knowing that you're measuring yeah, yeah, yeah. something. Yeah, exactly. And dude, yeah. I spoke to someone about this. Uh, this is going off topic a little bit. Yeah. Apparently, this is a, uh, a survival mechanism. Yeah. Apparently, you and I are, are part of the old tribes yeah. who were like uh, the paranoid types that would keep everyone else alive yeah. because you would be super sensitive to certain things. So yeah. when someone measures your heart rate, you go, oh my God, I'm highly aware of what you're doing. You know? yeah. So apparently that that is from the our earliest evolutionary time. Yeah, you're just where, sitting around yeah. foraging. Nobody said a word yeah. in about nine what? hours and all of a sudden ragtag goes, what? Yeah, yeah. There's a saber tooth exactly. tiger about 85 <laughs> yards that way. He's downwind. Dude, or he's upwind or whatever, uh, yeah. They they did yeah. a test. They did a like a, a survey, I think, or a, whatever it is where you do those yeah. subject things, um, where they uh, they measure some uh, the the people who have this. Yeah. I don't know what it is, this personality type, and apparently they have the highest survival rate for anyone under twenty five <laughs> if they have that disposition, that over sensitive <laughs> type, because they're so concerned about the the normal things that people just yes. take for every day that uh yeah they're they're more likely to survive uh something unusual Which, happening yes so, it's like a superpower you but you have to also learn how to manage it i what i call this is because i have add or adhd but it's a borderline case oh, yeah God. it's yeah. a it's a borderline case and i always you said Everyone, your brain is like an automobile. Everybody gets an automobile when they're born, okay? Most people get a Toyota Camry. It's nice and comfortable and very reliable. And it doesn't go that fast. And it's not a sexy drive, but it will get you where you need to be very reliably. People with ADHD get Lamborghinis, all right? It's really sexy and really fun and really uh, interesting and wild. But if you don't know how to drive it, you are going to fishtail every time there's a bend in the road. And or yeah. if it's a straight road, you'll go, fuck this, let's gun it. So you have to learn how to drive your Lamborghini. And so yeah, yeah. we have to learn how to master that nervous system and tell ourselves, oh, no, back down, back down. Like now I can go to the doctor's office and my wife will go in with me. She'll show me pictures of Instagram of cool things while they're strapping it on me. And then, oh, 122 over 80. Oh, 122 over 78. It's like, yeah, see, I told you. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, uh, yeah, yeah, that's all it is. But it's mental mastery. It takes forever to get it. And it doesn't it always really, work. It really does. Yeah, you're right. Uh, but yeah, it, it, I think it starts to fail when you know you're tricking yourself as well. <laughs> yeah, you know <laughs> well, who's really me, good? You know? <laughs> I will give you this. This is a freebie. Um, Sam Harris, he is a uh, neurologist. He's a neuroscientist. He's also a philosopher. He's extremely interesting. And he is all about meditation and mastering your mind. He says most people don't even have a relationship with their brain. They just think thoughts and they think, oh, well, that's who I am. They never examine their thoughts. And the problem is... I've gone down this road. Yeah. yeah. If you learn how to examine your thoughts and master the ones that are problematic and master the ones that can fishtail you, you begin to... Uh, exhibit a level of calm and balance that allows you to get all kinds of things done in your life so yeah he's for he's sure. the man for that he's really good for that i have so. a little story that will kind of get us into that that territory yeah but um, i i cut you off firefighting now you're a firefighter so firefighting was uh it's the best job I've ever done. Okay. Uh, I mean, I loved opera. I love music. I've even, you know, I, I would say music is the most constant thing in my life, but firefighting uh -huh. feels like you're doing something that makes a difference. You're, you're actually doing a job that you know uh, a lot of people, it's not that they, a lot of people can't and probably wouldn't do it. Right. But you have to take moderate amount of risks when maybe you should, you know. Yeah. Maybe don't need to. Right. Uh, so, the, w but we do it anyway, you know. So, there, there are things where we've got like models in terms of how much risk you'll take. So, you'll take right. a moderate to, to high risk for saving someone's life, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and uh, we will take low risk for property, you know, um, uh, right. and, uh, and, and pets. But we stick pets in with, with people 
when I say we, I mean me and anyone else I know. I'm not saying that's the, the right. how firefighters do it, but if there's a pet and then there's a building, unless we're pulled out of there, we're getting that pet out of there. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, yeah, there, there is there is a rule book and, a, and, and guidelines and all the rest of it, but, but generally firefighters deal with a lot of stuff that um, a lot of people can feel the benefit from immediately so like i was saying to you yesterday yesterday the day before when we had a quick mm-hmm. chat we do so many other things like we deal with floods uh, yeah we deal with uh, gas leaks we deal with suicides road traffic collisions of course fires building fires wildfires all sorts of different types of fires chemical problems as well firefighting is usually called in for that so you you learn a great many skills and for mm-hmm. someone like me who likes doing teaching singing you know um i liked conducting as well conducting mm-hmm. choirs and i like doing a lot of different things in the music when i got to firefighting and i realized there's lots of these subcategories we do like oh we do water rescue uh-huh. we're firefighters and we rescue people from the water that's so cool what, how do we do that you know and you, uh, there's all these modules and things that you have to to pass and learn so you feel like you're a student all over again the moment you become one mm-hmm. and every time you get through the whole batch of you know uh, things you've got to learn they've changed it and the procedures have changed so you have to learn it again or they mm-hmm. brought out new equipment so we'll do things like tactical ventilation for how to you know ventilate a building um when there's a fire or whatnot and a new piece of kit comes out we have to learn how to do that or we do things like working at heights which is not to do with the ladders well it is but it's to do with um you know harnesses and whatnot and yeah uh, that that sort of like rope work and, and things as well so there's just so many uh, little jobs that, that came along with it and i've yeah. done all sorts of weird things but the one thing i've never done is i've never rescued a cat from a tree ah. i've never done that i have rescued a girl scout from a toilet from a bathroom before <laughs> <laughs> I had to bust the door down. She got stuck inside. It was one of those uh, Victorian kind of doors that just, you know, once they shut, the thing right. just jams and nobody could, could get it open. No one could kick it down or anything. So we had to get a big ass halogen bar and I had to Good you know, Lord. Uh, wrench the thing open. <laughs> um, that, that was one of the weirder things. But the other things to deal with, you know, um, have, have just felt very beneficial um, mm-hmm. in terms of getting people out before something serious happened. There's a lot of frustrating things that happen, though, as well with firefighting, like answering a lot of hoax calls or yeah. false alarms or, right. you know, being turned around and um, then being given the wrong information in terms of location and people right. in danger. And that's been difficult, you know, I would say. But I would say road traffic collisions are the one thing I would I would say some of the things I've seen will haunt me forever. But, you know, uh, I'm glad I was there at the same time. So, yeah, yeah so, the fact that the fact that you put yourself there, I mean, first of all, managing your adrenaline must be extremely tricky. Oh, right. So, uh, yeah, yeah, about that. So, let, yeah, but my <laughs> adrenaline management uh, is a learning curve, a yeah. real learning curve, because I didn't realize anything about once it's in, how long it stays in for. Yeah. Um, so that that was a, a big issue. So, yeah. The, the, the thing that you may know as well, if you're in a similar disposition to me, is that when that kicks in, you yeah. can feel your heartbeat in your eyeballs and you start <laughs> to feel your vision go, woof, woof, woof. So there's been a few times where they would say to me, you know, we think there might be someone inside. You have to go up through the, the staircase and I'd be like, <gasps> so, so that, that moment. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, the more incidents I attended, uh, you start to feel it as background noise. The symptoms would still happen, but you'd be mm-hmm. like, yeah, I've been expecting this. Oh, yeah. hello, darkness, my old friend, you know? So yeah. you start to feel the uh, the the lump in the throat and the, the heartbeat eyeball thing. Uh, and it stopped feeling like it was getting in the way of my decision-making because before there would be a kind of a, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Whereas when the training finally is allowed yeah. to kick in, it, it does get a lot easier. But uh-huh. there are still times where, when we're in a building, we don't know if someone's inside or not, but we go up the staircase and you feel the stairs crack underneath and the flames are around you going, hmm. Yeah. I, I really wish I sat this one out. You know? <laughs> well, it, you would have to be a sociopath, no, a psychopath to not feel a rush of adrenaline. And I would imagine there might even be some psychopaths that make for excellent firemen and, 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 uh, and risk takers because they simply don't have a nervous system that gets affected by it. They're just very cold and calculated and they can just go right in but um you know away from the job yeah well the thing about 
about as I understand that, I think you need the emotional investment as yeah. a firefighter to do it because you will make some decisions and go. I'm not. I'm not saying psychopaths wouldn't make a good firefighter, but what yeah. I am saying is a psychopath might look at a situation and go, "This is not good for my personal survival," and just know? stay out. Or so what, yeah. Whilst, as, yeah, a, a psychopath and a sociopath are probably very good at surviving, and they probably look at a situation and say, "I could answer the scream," or <laughs> "Yeah, there's I could a let that scream die down and then wait till later." You know? <laughs> uh, yeah. Plus, so, you don't necessarily want to take a psychopath and put an axe in his hand. So um, that's no, also another. No, you really don't. So, <laughs> so I would say that the firefighters, everyone I've met, has been uh, very much kind of uh, a humanist. They've been someone yeah. who. Is very much about uh, it's worth the risk. And right. If something happens to themselves, at least, you know, they went and, and went in. There's been times where some of the guys I've, I've worked with were held back because there was a, a, it's a, not a very nice story. There was a house on fire, with children upstairs, and the roof on the lower level was about to collapse. And the guys were basically being held back. The firefighters were going in regardless. Mm -hmm. But if they went in, they would have gone in. They would have gone down with that building. Uh -huh. So, but those those firefighters would have taken that risk anyway. Yeah. But literally, when they were held physically from going into that building, within 10, 20 seconds, the entire thing collapsed. Uh -huh. And they would have been underneath it. But yeah. firefighters are often of a disposition where they would rather take that risk than, yeah. than sit back and do nothing. Yeah. So I would say that... For all the firefighters I've ever met, they are all the most generous kind of, you know, I'd rather take that risk and save a stranger. And it could be me that, that ends up biting it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would I'd probably not think a sociopath or a psychopath would yeah. do it also because it doesn't pay well. The pay sucks. <laughs> I don't know what it's like in America, but here it is a it's terrible, not, terrible wage. So you do it because uh, you love it and you want to help. Um, you don't do it because you want the money. They they don't get paid as as much as um, say a successful oh. voice actor. So yeah, yeah. So whilst I was I was firefighting, I took that approach that we've talked about before um, when it came to not saying no or not listening to the body. I stopped. Um, appreciating when I needed to take some time off. Uh -huh. And I, I basically just attended every incident I possibly could. Uh -huh. And it started to get really busy. So my, uh, my station was, I'm in a small place, but it's in between two larger stations. So we okay. often get called out as the second unit. Right. And I was still doing other things like teaching, lecturing, doing all my other bits and pieces, you know, on the side. And eventually I just woke up one day with double vision and uh, everything was taken exhaustion was still, uh, youtubing as just well just mental exhaustion so at first well at first i didn't know all, all i knew was that i had to get to university to do a lecture um uh, i'd i'd done a 20 hour wildfire so i knew i was tired um we we'd been called out two times in the same day um we were did like a you're meant to be relieved every 4 hours for extreme firefighting but that never happens mm -hmm. uh, and uh, i think we'd we'd done something like 18 hours in a row and then we got turned around to be relieved and then we got called back out to the same fire again for four more hours or something that was terrible and i think i slept for three hours then woke up and i saw two of everything and i thought oh no this mm -hmm. is not good so i i covered one eye and took my motorbike <laughs> into the city to do my my lecture and i thought okay it's it's kind of it's, this is manageable. I'll just look at one eye today. And that was, that's one of the problems, man. If your body's telling you no, and yeah. you're like, hey, I've got double vision. I'll just close one eye. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the problem that I was facing. I was doing this whole kind of, this is no problem. This is fine. Yeah. When I was at a fire, if I was quite close to the flames, sometimes the, the chief would t come up to me and say, hey, man, look, look to your left. And I'd, I'd look down and I'd see the number plate of the car next to me had bent all the way out and i didn't have my mask on you know and i was thinking oh okay it's quite hot after all i've done a lot of it's okay it's okay it's fine um so the second day i woke up with double vision again and I went all right i've i've read somewhere that this this could be like neurological so i'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to hospital so i went to hospital and uh saw the neurologist and they booked me in for an MRI and they also um, booked me in to see the eye doctor. And when I went to the, um, the MRI, uh, terrifying, a terrible noise that machine makes. Uh. But when I went to the eye doctor, he looked in, into my eye and said, oh yeah, um, is it sore? And I said, no, 
no, it's fine. I just I see two of everything. And he said, are you sure? Because there's metal fragments in your eye. And I went, oh, <sighs> all right, okay. I've just been for an MRI. <laughs> and the guy was like, well, let's take a look at them. So he... <laughs> He, he wrenched these bits of, of metal out of my eye and, uh, and found that they were non-ferrous, which means they won't get pulled off of, by the MRI. And, uh, yeah. Uh, so From firefighting? Okay. From firefighting? Yeah. Jesus. Uh, possibly. I mean, I'm not sure, you know. He, he asked if I'd been working with an angle grinder recently, and I maybe had. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Because uh, I'd been, I think I had been filing down a nail at home um, as well because there was a a little man cave I was making and I'd yeah. use an angle grinder to level out a nail. So I wasn't sure, but but he, he was finding these metal pieces in my eye and um, they thought at the time, okay, maybe this has got something to do with it, but I needed to get neurological testing done. And a lot of my tests came up clear. So I got the spinal tap, the lumbar puncture, which wasn't nice by the way. Um, <laughs> that's where they put the needle into your spine and you know that was yeah, not not good. I went through a load of tests, and the neurologist clinically concluded that I had something called uh, functional neurological disorder, which is where your your brain loses connection to the neural pathways that go uh-huh. to your your limbs. And also, because I was getting double vision, um, they had to do a diagnosis by exclusion that it ended up being something called myasthenia gravis, which is an mm-hmm. autoimmune disease, where my left eye is basically underactive. Uh-huh. And because it's underactive, I don't get the, the correct picture. So it's almost like one eye droops down. Mm-hmm. And my eye was closing over. It was twitching. I just had a lot of symptoms, man. Right. And then over a few weeks, I lost the ability to walk. I was thinking, okay, this is fine. I, I'll be all right. You know, I could, I, could still, I could still do YouTube. I can still do streaming. I can still, you know, I just kept saying, this is fine. This is fine. And every time... I tried to fight this as a, as a firefighter. You fight this. You've got something right. wrong. You fix it. It made it worse. So I think I stopped being able to walk because my body basically went, no, you don't, son. You know, yeah. stop trying to fight this. Yeah. So the harder I fought, the worse my symptoms got. And then I was on a cane, walking around with a cane, dragging my legs across the floor. Um, it was horrible. Like, I, w- I would say that I went through physio. I went to firefighter rehab. Um, I had, you know, probably two years of you know up and down and I, I went through moments where when i was in physical therapy and rehab where i could almost walk properly no problem everything was okay um but then it would go right back down again using um some of the the sensory problems that you know that that we encounter of people draining us noise started to become an issue like an, a loud noise would send my mobility into a tailspin i'd be like dude what is going on here so I had a psychotherapist, I had a physical physical therapist, I had all these neural physio exercises, I had so many things I could do, um, but I could not solve it because every time I tried to claw back health, it just found a way of kicking me down again. Ah. And the, the lows were really bad, but it never put me back to depression that well, I had good. when I was 28. Okay. Yeah, I just, I just kept feeling like, what's going on here? Am I ever gonna get better? Um, and the, uh, all the advice was do meditation, do mindfulness. And I was like, dude, I'm a fucking master at mindfulness. I am so mindful of everything. You know, it's like, I would say I'm too mindful. I, I, you know, I'm so here um, that everything affects me so much. Um, and meditation didn't actually do anything for me because all it did was irritate me when I wasn't <laughs> meditating. So when I was meditating, I thought, this is great. This is lovely. As soon as I stopped, horrible. Absolutely, just you know, the worst symptoms would come after an hour or two of meditating mm. um, because I couldn't get back to that place, right? Um, and only probably in the last six months, I have finally started to walk not normally, but okay, better, better. I still have a little limp, uh-huh. um, but uh, I, I would say that the, the symptoms start to change once I managed to block out everything that was going on up in my head. So the signals that were, um, I'll give you an example of what, what was wrong first. What was wrong was my, my symptoms were real. My conditions, they are real. There's nothing, you know, right. There's nothing kind of psychosomatic. Yeah. It's no, not somatic you know. painting. These are actual things. No, no, no. Yeah. No, these are, these are caused by the body um, buildup of all the problems and then the body unleashing it, you know, okay. as a kind of a, 
you know, you've triggered this. So the autoimmune isn't a made up thing. The autoimmune was triggered by stress and uh, mm. years and years of stress. But now I've got it, you know, I had to try and deal with it. So I'm just trying to explain that, yeah. you know, this isn't all in my head. But I, f I felt that even though the neurologist told me that, I did not believe it. You mm -hmm. know, um, I just kept thinking this is in my head. I'm, I'm, I must be able to will myself out of it. And it's kind of weird that um, thinking that it was all in my head uh, was one of my major problems because once I accepted that this is a real thing, mm -hmm. I actually do have to deal with this. I was able to fix some of my spiritual issues that actually led to me being able to free myself. And the, the one thing that really helped was in meditation, you are taught to turn off thought. Yeah. Be here, you know, just, you know, transcendental meditation is, is supposed to be very good as well. Um, but uh, the, the whole thing about meditation wasn't working for me was once I was out of it, uh, it was too much again. So right. I managed to try and get thought off whilst I wasn't meditating. That was really hard, like really, really hard and required uh, a lot of stuff I'm not going to have time to talk about right now. Um, yeah. But the moment I was able to do that, uh, then I didn't have to worry about setting time aside to meditate. I still do it, but I didn't have to worry about that being the, the, the practice because that wasn't enough um, yeah. to, to help me kind of kickstart the body. Physio was all about letting the body remember the moves. Like right. when I put my foot down, what would happen was my foot would be like not receiving the right messages. So my foot would do this on the ground. It would kind of wobble and shake. Um, needless to say, the moment all of this started, there was no more firefighting. I was done, you know, straight away. Yeah. And uh, at the beginning of this year, they gave me my marching papers. So I'm, I've been officially done. Uh -huh. um, but I've been able to YouTube this entire time while yeah. all of this happened. So um, it's been a, a real blessing. But what I will say is the, the impact of being more spiritually aware. I'm not talking about finding Jesus, although if people do find Jesus, great, good, good for yeah, you. Great. I'm, Tell I'm him happy. I said hi. But um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm... To be honest with you, I'm, I'm actually, you know, totally open minded and agnostic with that regard. But yeah, it's more about this kind of uh, an awakening for th for how invasive this is mm -hmm. when it comes to your daily tasks. How can I function normally when I'm dealing with a neurological disorder and my mind will not shut the hell down? Keep saying, yeah. you're an idiot. You did this. Why did you upload that? Oh, my God. Do you see that comment? That comment was so toxic. What an arsehole. I can't believe that person said this to me. All these thoughts were going around my head and I needed them to stop. And the moment I got them to stop, um, everything got better. All my patterns have improved. My walking's yeah. better. My mood is better. Um, my illnesses have, you know, they're, they're still there, but they're not half as bad as they were. Right. I would say I have, you know, disruption from them. I can't run a marathon. Right. But I can run now. I couldn't do that pro probably before. Uh, I had a VR machine for a while. I strapped myself into one of them. I could run on the spot, you know. Uh, but, um, I was, I, I was, look, I looked like a, a zombie from The Walking Dead, yeah. you know, like one of those kind of, uh, you know. Right. So, um, but yeah, I, I would just say that um, from a mental health point of view, um, being able to recognize what the ego is and not using the word ego as a as a kind of a, oh you've got a big ego therefore no your ego is bad. who you are yeah yeah it's your sense of self at yeah. the moment you're able to take yourself out of that and be aware that it's there so it's almost like the i was told this right at the start they said oh meditation is is about raising your awareness and when you're aware that you're aware this is good and i was like hmm bullshit you know so, <laughs> so was, uh, that was how it was explained to me and only like six months ago i went aware that i'm aware yes yes, yes that makes sense i'm getting that now you know but that that was only once i stopped the chatter so whenever my mind um talks to me too much you know i'm now able just to quieten that down and stop the bullshit yeah and uh the, i can enjoy silence now so yeah that was missing I think I've just had years and years of chatter and judgment, self-judgment. I'm so hypercritical. Mm -hmm. like, I think artists probably are in general. It's a very but common you thing. And, yeah, and you go, oh, man, I'm, I'm going to fucking stew over that later. You know, you sit, you lose sleep over it. And, yeah. you know, um, like it's a sensitivity thing as well. When I said I'm sensitive, that's one of the things I sit and think about. 
So, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I would say with, with people, being able to shut out your voices uh, inside and your own critical voice can solve a lot of problems, especially if you've got depression, anxiety, and illness, a chronic illness, because you're probably going to be talking to yourself even more about how useless you are while yeah. you're feeling down. And uh, yeah, so uh, the, the whole thing of, oh, be positive, oh, meditate, oh, be mindful, it all sounds like new age bullshit, but the journey is is like the same as someone trying to work out. You know, you can't avoid it. Right. If you don't go on it, you're never going to discover it. So I would say if you're in a permanent state of discovery and you're in a permanent state of being able to, to think about life as more than just the thoughts that are in your head and the thoughts, who's thinking those thoughts? Yeah. Because, you know, who's doing that? Is it your brain? If it's your brain, then then what's driving all the feelings, you know? So you have to think, I, I think as people, we have to think more than, you know, just these little, I think they're, they're just, they're insignificant. They're not who you are. They don't make up your personality. No. Um, and uh, something that I think a lot of people rebel against is the idea that you're not your story. So this whole life story, um, that's not you, you know? I, I now firmly believe that. I believe that, that everything that's happened to us is not me. Um, right. That's just an experience. And uh, only when I was able to shut the goddamn voices out did I believe that your personality is constructed and has a lot of stuff going on inside it, but you can take yourself outside of it, take a look at it and go, wow, it's useful. The mind's a tool um, and uh, you shouldn't always use it. You know, sometimes you need yeah. to just let it be. People, so. uh, people <laughs> should understand that you are not your thoughts, you are your actions. And you cannot control every thought that comes into your head. In fact, you don't even get to choose the thoughts that come in your head. They arrive. Now, you can choose which ones to focus on and then have influence over the next thoughts that come. So you can't choose every thought you have, but you can choose how you feel about those thoughts. So if you have a negative thought, you can simply say, going to let that pass right by. Like I'm watching a parade. going to let that car pass by and do nothing about it. Here's the thought I'm going to focus on. I'm not that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to put into action a process of new thoughts that already work for me that lead to positive action. And hey, guess what? If I think something positive lead to a positive action, I then start feeling good. I think, I do, I feel better. You do that enough God. times. You do that you enough times. Finder. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Think, do, you, feel better, it, ragtag. Oh, Jesus. No, that, seriously, that is the calculus I learned from my cognitive behavioral therapist. He said, look, it boils down to this. Um, life will change when you realize that bad things happen, but you can handle it. And here's how you handle it. When something goes wrong and everything, something will go wrong every single day of your life. Every hour, something will go wrong to a different degree. When you can say, okay, that happened and I didn't want that to happen, but... I'm going to realize what I lost because of that. I'm going to focus on how I can get it back in a way that is in my control. And then I'm going to take action immediately. I'm not going to do it tomorrow or the next day. I'm going to take action as soon as it's appropriate. And I will start to feel better. Think, do, feel better. There's this uh, one thing my psychotherapist said to me that I've, I really like this. Um, I can't actually remember exactly how she said it, but it was something along the lines of meet yourself where you are not where you think you ought to be. Yeah. And I thought that was such an awesome thing because then you can you can stop uh, spiraling. I was just explaining to the chat that it's okay to have thoughts and just observe them as they go by rather than look at that thought and think, God, I'm a piece of shit for having that thought. Yeah. You know, so just what you said about you can choose how you feel about it. So I love the idea of this is where we're at. Uh, not where you yeah. think you ought to be because where you ought to be is unattainable. It's the same bullshit that they sell you in life about retirement. And if you work hard for 40 years, you get your, your goddamn pension. I'm never stopping work. I'm never, ever going to stop no. working. I love working. Like Not working is a disaster. If you don't have a purpose in life, what the hell are you doing? You know. Yeah. So if, if, if you retire off a, off a hard labor job, which I would have done from firefighting anyway, I'd find another job to do. Yeah. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a hobby. It would have to be something I can monetize to feel like I'm doing something and constantly, you know, like you've got a cycle going on and you've got a purpose to get up for every day. I think that's really important. We've got to dispel the myths you know of of how damaging social media is and how damaging the expectations of what a life should should entail you know in terms of yeah. money retirement and all that 
That's what my guy did for me. He said, look, people always think, because I was a victim of this. I thought, if I just get to here, I'll reach this point where I'll always be happy. It was this lovely horizon that somebody who was naive can just create. Oh, as soon as I get here, everything will be great. And then I actually reached that point. I realized, well, why is everything not great? Why am I now having panic attacks? And it's because when you stop, this is my personal philosophy. You were born, you're given two things to get through life, a body and a mind. That's it. Those are your two tools. And if you use them constructively, then nature, the universe, whatever you want to call it, rewards you with a feeling of contentment and satisfaction and fulfillment. Why is that? Because that's how we survive. I can't answer it beyond that, but I've never encountered anything that refutes that. When you are mentally and physically engaged in a positive, constructive way, no matter what it is, you feel like you're having a good day and you go to bed at night thinking, I had a good day. I need to do that every day. And what my guy taught me was, you got to do that every day for the rest of your life. Retirement means you're just not seeking income anymore, but it doesn't mean you stop doing challenging, fun, constructive things that allow you to connect with an idea or another person. So yeah, I'm trying to retire financially, but it doesn't mean I'm going to stop doing things that I love. I'm just one of the lucky people like you who gets to do something he loves and gets paid for it. So I don't feel like I work. You know, it's Drew, it's um, simple. You know I was going to say something that's a little bit kind of mm, puts a somber <laughs> note on it, but it makes me think of um, the way people uh, think about Christmas and how this is the perfect time of year and everyone rushes to have the perfect Christmas and everyone's pushing each other out of the way and fighting over the turkey and all the rest of it. I'm telling you this because January, we used to call suicide month. Uh, I was wondering, how many calls did yeah. you get during the Christmas oh, season and in January? Oh, There's a come down. There's a come down. I yeah, tell my dude. stream this. I said, look, yeah. it's Christmas. I streamed on Christmas Day for a little bit. I said, it's Christmas. It's like every other day. It's special if you want it to be, and there's no reason for it not to be special. But it's yeah, the but same as every... Here. Right. You, you still... Here. Yeah. yeah. You still have to... Like my guy used to talk about needs. Everyone has the same basic needs. You still got to meet your needs. That doesn't mean yeah. on Christmas you take the day off from being constructive, you know? So... Yeah, and in January, I said, you know what January is? It's the same as December and November. There are ways that make them different, but there are ways you can make them the same. Every day, you've got to get up and think, what am I going to do today that's in my control that brings constructive, purposeful, positive things in my life? Because that's how I'm going to have a great day. And life is just nothing but a bunch of days. For sure. Everything we do has a, a colossal impact on the immune system because when you stop for Christmas, how many people get ill? Of course they do because yeah. your immune system is being so stressed and it was the same when i was in opera finish a contract your last night last show you get sick get ill the next day yeah. but i started to realize that the next day you should be up at 6 a.m going to the gym you know that stops the illness right in its tracks because you know you've given yourself a new purpose and you know when people think that they've stopped everything just goes woof and drops right. so i think that the changing our baseline is like uh yeah a really important thing and uh it I takes time i think i've had yeah, it does. Um, I think as a content creator, um, I don't create content that necessarily tells people that. But I think one day I would like to, you know, like create content that moves things towards that way. Um, I just create things to try and make people laugh. That's, yeah. that's pretty much it. And people tell me that, you know, that it's lifted them out of their... Because it does. Because uh, it of does. Course, of course. Yeah. Who has uh, ever typed some... that and didn't mean it? Oh, I feel shitty. I'm going to tell them that I feel great. <laughs> People tend to do that when it really does help them even a bit. Yeah, I think I think the character you play as well as does help with that as well. You know, Pathfinder's, you know... Even wants, though he's evil. He is terribly <laughs> evil. I mean, if you didn't take satire from that video, then I failed, you know? <laughs> I really was... I mean, I, I did it with a serious tone, but it was satirical all yeah. the way through. Yeah, of course. Should have come across. <laughs> well, I tell you what we'll do. We'll, we'll get you out of here, but if you want, I always do an ad lib. And, and when I get to gamers and streamers, I don't expect them to be like actors. Even though you're an opera singer, you're an actor. You deliver a performance. You're a character. All right. You are just because you're singing doesn't mean you're not delivering lines, but I'll let you off the hook. And if you want, I will do Pathfinder lines for you in whatever situation you want, as long as it's, you know, not inappropriate. But uh, I'll let you have a go at Pathfinder. I was I was going to say we've got a real toilet paper shortage right now. So I was going to do something with that. So 
<laughs> I was going to get Pathfinder to find me an alternative way to, uh, you know, to solve my problems. But it, it can't be using toilet paper. Hey, guys. It's Pathfinder here with a little PSA for the pandemic. Those of you who are running low on toilet paper can do what I do, which is never wipe at all. Or you can use a Mozambique because that's about where it belongs. (laughs) (laughs) High five from six feet away. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Well done, man. Well, there it is. Oh, man. But seriously, has anyone got any toilet paper? Because I am running <laughs> low. We'll just have to have Ragtag back in uh, because we didn't get to a lot of stuff. I, first of all, I need beard tips if I'm ever going to attempt to grow one. And I, yeah, that's, see, you're already putting me to shame. So, so I, I, I say if, if your five o'clock shadow is, is ferocious, then your beard growing will be absolutely fine. If you struggle with a day or two, I, th- I think, you know, it will take a lot it's longer. It's going to be, yeah. Whatever. I'm going to have a Keanu Reeves beard. It's just all patchy. Right. You know, Mine like was a, patchy as well. Mine was yeah. very patchy, like down down here. Yeah. That that didn't grow in well at all, but eventually, you know, I'm like a fucking Yeti now. Who knows? I know, really. I, I just, I'm assuming you're ragtag. It could be anybody. You know, could be anybody yeah. with one of those store-bought beards. All right. So you let me know when you're live, and we're going to thank Ragtag. Everybody, love you. Mean it. Be well. Go easy on yourself. All right? Meet yourself where you are. That's it. Not That's good advice. Not where you think you ought to be. And in my case, for my advice, it all boils down to what's in your control. Learn to let go of what you can't control. Learn to focus on what you can, because those are the things that you can change. Done. I'm live now. And by the way, it takes practice, so it ain't going to all happen at once. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Baby Steps with Ragtag and Pathfinder.